You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. As we dive in today, we look at the reality of what these three years, six days, 15 hours, and one morning of Jesus' life and ministry was. When we talk about the three years, Jesus really had a life in ministry of about three years. Of his 33 years, only three were in ministry, where he did all the miracles, and um, he healed people and fed people and did these different things, and his teachings. And then we go through the Passion of the Holy Week, And we get to this one morning. But what we need to understand in this is that everything has been leading up to this morning. Everything in history, past, present, and future, relies on the gravity and the weight of the cross of this one morning where the grave loses its grip on humanity finally. It loses its grip on you and I, and what takes hold of us is the very life of Christ. So we look at this one morning today with a brand new lens. Now, sometimes, one of the things that I I guess I've I've pictured this as is uh, like a family, I don't know if you've ever seen it, where a family will surprise their kids that they're going to like Disney World, so they just pick them up from school, and the mom and dad look a little sullen, you know, a little, and the kids are like, Hey, Mom and Dad, is everything all right? And they're like, get in the car. And they're like, what did you do? I don't know. You know, and they start arguing like, I don't know, we're in super amounts of trouble. And they're nervous, and they're driving down the road, and on their way to the airport, Mom and Dad, like, put on mouse ears, like, we're going to Disney World. The kid's like, no way. And it's like this amazing thing, and then they look back over their shoulder, and they're like, I knew it. I wondered why Mom was buying Mickey Mouse stuff last week. I just didn't know. I didn't connect the dots. Today, We're going to explore how that dynamic was at work in the life of the disciples and in the life of the church even today. Join me. I'm going to read from Luke 24, the first eight verses. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone and it was rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered it, they did not find a body. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright and fear, the women bowed down their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you when he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be handed over to the hands of sinners, crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Verse 8. Then they remembered his words. All of a sudden, they connected the dots. They remembered his words. They remember the prophecy. The angel did a good job kind of reminding them it word for word when they said, remember how he told you? Remember what he said while he was still with you in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be delivered over into the hands of sinners, crucified, but on the third day he would rise again. Don't you remember? Did you forget the rise in three days part? Remember the comfort and the hope he gave you while he was still with you. And you may ask, okay, when did Jesus say this? We can look in the Gospel of Luke, which we've been studying this past four months, and know that... um, this, this has been a narrative Jesus held often. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus talks about it before they go up the Mount Tr- Transfiguration. And then afterwards, he tells his disciples this very thing. I'm going to be betrayed, handed over to, to the rulers and the priests, and put to death. And on the third day, rise again. Again, in Luke chapter 18, on his way to Galilee, he talks to his disciples about it. He talks to them about it. At the Last Supper, Jesus was warning them. He was preparing them because, well, he's, think of it. He he knows it's going to break their heart. He knows it's going to confuse them, terrify them, and kind of make them feel like, what is happening? So he tries to forewarn them. It makes me think of a mom, a mom of about a six-year-old kid. And if you know those, they're in between the wiping and feeding all the time phase. And, um, and they're getting to a little bit of independence, but they're still very dependent. They're very clingy, right? Think of this. A mom who knows her child will be anxious if she's not right there on time to pick him up from school. So she tells him the night before, look, I'm coming back from Grand Rapids. I'll be at your school about 10 minutes late. Don't worry. Okay. 
the morning. She wakes up, has breakfast with him, and tells him, remember, I, I'm going to be a little bit late today. Uh-huh, she puts a note in there. Don't forget, enjoy your lunch, and I'm going to be about 10 minutes late. Puffy heart, mom, right? Puts it in the, puts it in the lunchbox. And then, as she drops him off, don't forget, Sammy, I'm going to be about 10 minutes late. Rajo, mama, right? And off he goes. Gets into class, has a great day at school, and then the bell rings at 3.35, and all the kids leave with their moms, and there sits this child who thinks, it's happening. Throat tightens a little bit, and then fear upon fear compounds as one of the hall lights, the auto lights in the hallway goes dark. Oh, I live here now. <laughs> right? They just know, I can't, I can't believe it. And then the worst possible thing happens. The custodian comes in and empties the garbage. You're like, just throw me out with it. I'm human rubbish. I am forgotten. <laughs> and then like, and the teacher's like, your mom will be here sobbing. Like, oh, no. They forget. They forget. They forget what was told to them. No matter how many times. And there is a childlike faith in us that does that. And it happened to the disciples. It happened to the disciples. Jesus had prepared them over and over, but when they were overwhelmed with their own grief, loss, and shame, they went blind in their memories to what he had said. And we get overwhelmed. I'm not going to have you raise your hands. I'll just raise mine because I've been overwhelmed in grief, loss, and shame. We all get torn up by loss and shame, the sense of grief, a sense of failure. And when you go through these things, you can forget the promises of God that hang over you just like the disciples did. They forgot in their grief and shock at the loss of Jesus. They forgot at their shame that they ran away from him. They forgot at their sense of just loss. They walked around numbly with kind of a slack-jawed expression of fear and loss. And Jesus had come to set them free from loss, grief, and shame. He came to let them grieve as people who have hope. Yet there they were, despondent and hopeless. Are you ever so lost in your own life that you forget the promises of God given to you? Have you ever forgotten those promises that were spoken over your life and for, failed to remember what God has done for you? what he has promised to do for you because you are completely wrapped up and owned by your circumstances and not the promises of God? See, for us, we know that when they remembered the words of Jesus, they began to piece this together. But it wasn't just the words of Jesus that they would piece together. Remember the name of Christ when we call him the Word made flesh, the Word of God in human form, which means this. Scripture is like the garments Jesus wears. It's his language. It's his expression to us, the church. So when we talk about Scripture, they not only piece together what Jesus had said about his death, life, death, and resurrection, they piece together what the Scriptures had said about this. They started thinking of the prophets of old in Israel who had promised things about the Messiah. Things started to make sense. You may be uh, with us today, and you're like, yeah, man, I go to church twice a year, Christmas and Easter. I would like you to know we also have church next week, and you're invited. Um, but uh, but you, you may be a person who's here going, I don't really know why we have the Old Testament. If it's old, use the new model, right? But here's the reality. The old points us to the new. The old is an indicator, and we see this so very clearly when everything makes sense for the disciples and the women following Jesus. If Jesus' prophecy came true, God's promises in the Old Testament also begin to be fulfilled because Jesus, the living Word of God, fully reveals the written Word of God. And you can look into the scriptures and understand within the Psalms, we'll just look at the Psalms, one Psalm in particular today that was written over a thousand years before the life of Jesus and how clearly it points to him, his life, his death, and his resurrection. 
It points right back to him. Matt Kuman taught last week on uh, Palm Sunday, did an excellent job. And remember, he informed us that Romans invented crucifixion, the piercing of the hands and the feet and hanging on a cross in order for someone to, be die- to die. It was a slow, miserable death. And he pointed that out. Rome came online as uh, not a republic but an empire about 30 A.D., And crucifixion somewhere between 60 and 30 A.D. was really perfected by the Romans as a means of execution. And there was a psalm that was written a thousand years ago before that by King David. David ruled in Jerusalem in 1003 B.C. till 970 B.C., about 33 years in Jerusalem. And this is one of the psalms he wrote. The first words of this psalm are the last words of Christ. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? In, uh, in you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and they were saved. In you they trusted and they were not put to shame. But I I'm a worm, I'm not even a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me, hurling insults and shaking their head. I want you to just think with me. Think with me. This is David a thousand years previous. Jesus was betrayed, told by all of Jerusalem, screamed, crucify him, despised by the people, scorned by everyone. All who see me mock me. What did Herod do to Jesus? He said, well, if you're the king, you should wear a purple robe and a crown of thorns. This is a thousand years before this happened. They hurled insults and shook their head. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Those are almost word for word what the high priest Caiaphas said to Christ as he hung on the cross. If you are the Lord's anointed, come down. Won't won't your father save you? Psalmist goes on to say, Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast on you from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Jumping down a little, and this is where it gets like almost eerie. I am poured out like water. What happened when they pierced Jesus' side? Water flowed. Water flowed out of him. All my bones are out of joint. When you're crucified, your your joints hanging with the weight of your body begin to give way. Your shoulders dislocate. Your ankles, your knees. All my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth is dried up and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. What are some of the words of Jesus on the cross? He cried out, I thirst, I thirst. His tongue stuck to the roof of his mouth. Again, this is a thousand years before Jesus would suffer the death. He did. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. They pierce my hands and my feet. No one did that for the next 950 years. All my bones are on display. People stare at me and gloat over me. They divide my clothes and cast lots for my garment. This is critical. That we know when the the disciples started piecing this together, Think of what John, who stood at the foot of the cross the whole time, what he thought when this came into view. He watched the Roman soldiers take the seamless garment given to a Hebrew boy by his mother. He watched them take that garment from Jesus, and then he watched the Roman guards throw dice for the garment. What do you think he heard? He heard Psalm 22 in his head. They divided my clothes among them, and they cast lots for my garment. Again, a thousand years before Christ would be crucified, this was written. Finally, verse 30, posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. What did Jesus say in the end? It is finished. When we look at this, when we see it come together, let the church never forget the surety with which God put Jesus in this position to take our sin and shame. 
It was always Jesus. It's only been Jesus. He wasn't an afterthought from the fall. He was always the answer for your sin, my sin, the shame and brokenness and the grief that blinds us. Jesus was always the answer. Scripture points to it. It declares it. It tells you and I that the weight of Jesus' words is really like the weight of glory. It settles on to us. When Jesus speaks a word, says something, it carries the weight of glory and eternity. And we treat flippantly the word of God sometimes. We forget that we are people filled with the Holy Spirit, called to encourage, bless, and speak a word over the church. Do we not know the weight of glory that Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, when he spoke, it carries weight. Once Jesus' words came true about his life, his death, and his resurrection, those words now carry even more weight. This is why you and I search the scriptures. Have you ever had something going on in your life and you just open the scriptures and you're like, please God, just speak anything. Even if you tell me you don't like me, a word from you is better than nothing. Please, just speak. I beg you to speak. We search the scriptures because we know that the word of God, the flesh, Jesus Christ, the word in flesh, but also the word of God, scriptures, the garments he wears, we know that those carry weight, and they carry weight in our life. It's why we give verses to our kids at baptism. It's why we love Jeremiah 29, 11. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord. Plans to bless you and to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. It tells you and it tells me that this isn't all just some random happening thing. That before the dawn of the world, God had an intended plan for your life to bring glory to his son, Jesus Christ. And the disciples are seeing this in living color. They're piecing it all together and recognizing the weight of the words of Christ. Imagine with me what it was like to be Peter when all of a sudden he realized Christ had risen. Peter, who had denied Jesus three times and then looked him in the eyes that night. Imagine with me the weight of that. But there's another word spoken over his life. It's actually in Luke chapter 9. The best um, rendering of it, the best telling of it, is actually in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus asks his disciples, so who do they say that I am? Who is everybody saying I am? And some say, oh, they think you may be John the Baptist. He had been executed by this time, and they thought maybe Jesus was him reincarnate. Then they said, well, maybe you're Elijah. That's what some people are saying. Some think maybe even Moses. Jesus stops him and says, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, who I love super much, he's a guy who has foot and mouth disease. Not hand, foot, and mouth, just foot. He always seems to insert his foot in his mouth, but this time he really gets it right. He said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And you can almost feel it all stop. And Jesus turns to him and says, no man revealed that to you. You were told that by my heavenly father. And I will tell you this, Simon, his name was Simon till that point. You no longer will be called Simon. Your name is now Peter, Petros, rock. And on that rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Like how, when, when Jesus says that to you, you have to be a little at your friends like, uh, who? Rock, you know? That would be awesome unless you deny him three times. And you think, okay, I know Jesus said this, but how can it be true of me? I betrayed him. I'm a failure. So Peter goes back to his life fishing, believing the word of God is null and void, but it is never null and void. Jesus reinstates Peter. And to this day, we recognize and honor that Peter is the father of the Christian church. Peter is the father of the Christian church. He started the church movement. He's the first great evangelist. When he taught on the Temple Mount on Pentecost, we recognize that the word of God holds weight. And when Jesus said, I'm going to build my church on this rock, and the rock was faulty, Jesus wasn't. So praise God for you and for me that as frail and broken and messed up as we can be, Jesus isn't. 
He's not bound to your failures or your circumstances. He remains the Lord of glory. So I encourage you, I implore you, remember his words. Remember the words of Christ. Let them live in your heart and mind. Hold fast to them. What has he spoken over you in Scripture? Go to Scripture. Let him speak over you. What has he spoken to you? I would invite you today as families, when you go to get, like, I love that we have ham on Easter. I'm so excited. But, um, like, you sit down, and there's, like, a big old hind quarter of a pig, and you're like, yeah, and you're getting ready to stop. And read Psalm 139, 1 to 18. Read Psalm 139, 1 to 18. And I'll tell you this, that whole meal will lose focus, and you'll realize how much you are loved, intended, and purposed for in Christ Jesus you will realize just how intentional your life is. You're not a flippant happenstance. You are at the heart of God's intentions. He loves you. He's for you. He knit you together in your mother's womb all the days of your life from their beginning to their end. Not one of them was lived out before God laid the marker for him. God knows you. He loves you. It says, where can I go to hide from your spirit? If I go to the realm of the dead, you're there. If I go to the heights of heaven, you're there. You can't be separated from God. And the word of God does not return void. What has he spoken to you in scripture? Get into the word of God. It's why we drive you towards devotions every week. To read scripture and let the promises of God soak into your life. But what has he spoken to other people through you? What have other people, other believers spoken into your life? Allow the word of God to speak promises over you. When you read Psalm 139 as a family today, I invite you to just let the words wash over you and believe them and hold on to them as the promise of God. It's his word in your ears. It's for you. What has he spoken through others? Never forget that you, the spirit-filled church of Jesus Christ, are to claim the promises of God over broken lives. Speak the purposes of God over broken people. I have a prophecy that sits on my desk. It's from November 16th, 1994, where a guy said to me, laid his hand on me and prayed for me, and he said, one day you are going to preach, and you are going to stand, and you're going to declare the wonders of God. And I'm like, dude, I'm probably headed for jail. Leave me be. I was at YWAM, I was lost, but God wasn't. Speak a word of God over people. Don't forget what was spoken over you in Christ Jesus. And it all starts at one central point, that we don't forget over all things who we believe in. It's Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And the work he did for us is really summed up in this one word, forgiven. Church, hear it forgiven all your sin all your failure all your shortcomings are reconciled in the cross of christ and redeemed in his resurrection you are not called to be bound to that you are called upwards into christ's resurrection to live for him forgiven it's done it is finished It has no hold on you. You are the church. If there is one hope in this world, it is the church of Jesus Christ. Clinging to the resurrected life of Christ in the Holy Spirit, we are called forward. We have to believe we are forgiven. We are forgiven. Perfect people are not allowed in the church because A, they don't exist, and B, they're creepy. I don't like them. Perfect people are not part of the church. Forgiven people are. You are forgiven because of Jesus' death and resurrection. 3,000 years ago, the psalmist said it this way, He has done it. Like, doesn't your mind just want to be like, a thousand years before Jesus Christ, he wrote, He has done it. God knew the plan, God knew the outcome, and he was willing to patiently walk it out. A thousand years before Jesus, he has done it. Two thousand years ago from us, a man named Jesus hung on a cross and said, it is finished. Church, in Jesus Christ, all that broke you is finished. It is up to us to recognize that indeed he has done it. Indeed it is finished, but we are called. We are called upwards and obediently inwards to the kingdom of God to work out his will in this world, 
to shine the light of Christ to any and all who would see it. He has done it. It is finished. You are forgiven. Live as people redeemed. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for who you are and what you do. Thank you for the gift of life in you. Lord, apart from you, we are nothing. But in you, we come to life. We find purpose, redemption, hope, and restoration. So today, we cling to those. We cling to those. Help us today, God, to find the joy of our own resurrection, of the hope that you are still resurrecting things long dead in our life for the glory of Jesus Christ. You are forgiving the sin, redeeming the brokenness, and using people such as us for the glory of your name. Lord, we love you. And so now we respond in worship to the one true King, the high King of heaven, our Lord and Savior, who has indeed done it, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.